Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for the introduction. And thank you, Shannon and Jacqueline, for uh, the organization. Uh, I'm really excited to talk, uh, talk to you today about this uh, topic, even though it's, it, it, honestly, it is a little bit of a weird format. I do not see you. Uh, so um, uh, I cannot interact with you directly. Uh, but uh, I'm very thankful that we do have technology to um, make these seminars, um, make, make these uh, lectures uh, possible. Uh, so looking at the list of participants, I noticed a few familiar names. Uh, there were a few uh, former Lawrence students, hello. Uh, there were also a few participants of my uh, seminar uh, last sum from last summer uh, at Bjorklunden. So it was really, really nice to see those names. I'm uh, very happy that you guys could make it. And uh, welcome, uh, welcome everyone um, whom, I, whom I never met. Um, uh, so I'm going to share my screen right away. Uh, I will be doing a PowerPoint and uh, at some point we'll also try to, try to show a video. Um, so uh, the topic today is the Great Patriotic War, World War II through Soviet eyes. You can see my uh, email right here. So if somehow I do not answer all your questions, or if you come up with a question later, or you want some reading recommendations, uh, please uh, just uh, just email me. You can also easily find my uh, email on Lauren's um, website. Um, so, um, as you can, as you know from the description, I will be talking about the Russians' memory about the Second World War, which, uh, in the Russian context, is usually taken as just the Eastern Front of the war, uh, the USSR's war with Germany, which lasted from June twenty second, uh, nineteen forty one, till May uh, 9th, nineteen forty five. Um, it doesn't mean that we do not study the rest of the war in Russia, uh, but this is the most prevalent topic of conversation and remembrance uh, in uh, the country. Uh, and you notice that uh, we call uh, this uh, the, uh, the part of the war on the Eastern Front, Vilika Atechistene Vaina, uh, which usually is translated as the Great Patriotic War, uh, but I would say that the more accurate translation would be the Great War for, um, for the Fatherland. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, and uh, after I talk about this part, uh, we will make a little break. Um, and in the second part of the lecture, I will be talking about the siege of Leningrad, uh, which was likely the most dramatic event uh, of the war. Uh, so the idea to tackle this topic, um, actually, as a, as a Bjorklinton seminar originally, uh, grew out of conversations with my students, with my American friends and American family members. Um, just kind of thanks to those conversations, I realized just how little people in the West are aware uh, of the USSR's participation in the Second World War and the impact that the war had uh, on my country. So all the people I have talked to, especially my students, have repeatedly reported that um, uh, there was either no conversation about the USSR and the Second World War uh, in their high school history classes, or the maximum they could learn was that USSR and the US were uh, allies during the war, and that was it. Um, so there was not much conversation about uh, Russia's contribution to the war, uh, which I would uh, argue was crucial, uh, and the tremendous sacrifice that the Soviet people paid for the victory. Um, I also often notice that in the American media, uh, during the month of May, which is the time when Victory Day is celebrated in Russia and in Europe more generally, uh, one can see reports about Victory Day Parade in Moscow. But those articles generally would concentrate on Putin's politics and Putin's political use of the parade to show Russian military might uh, and to signify to the world Russia's readiness for aggression. Um, I'm going to... So next picture here is uh, the parade on the, on the Red Square. And this actually happened this year uh, in spite of the coronavirus, which uh, is problematic, to say the least. Um, uh, so it is absolutely true uh, that the war and its memory has been used by Putin to promote his political agenda, to argue that Russia is a strong country, proud for its history, and unified around its strong leader, same as it was in the 1940s when we won the war. A very recent and blatant example of political use of the war just happened a month ago, and you are looking at it. Uh, during the coronavirus um, pandemic, all Victory Day festivities were canceled in Russia in May. Uh, and it was supposed to be a huge celebration because this year is the 75th uh, anniversary of the end of the war. 
Um, so it was supposed to be celebrated in great pomp. However, Putin still made a decision to hold the parade on the Red Square on June 24th, a week prior to the vote on changes to the Russian constitution. And one of those changes allows him to be in power until 2036. It is impossible to see, not, not to see these two events as linked, um, and the celebration of the victory basically helped Putin to symbolically legitimize his power grab. So it is absolutely important to be aware that the memory of the Great Patriotic War is used by the Russian government for its own propaganda purposes. However, it is no less important to recognize that war memory is not just part of the propaganda machine. It is a very strong and authentic, it has a very strong and authentic appeal uh, among all Russian, uh, Russians, pro-government and opposition alike. Uh, and there are very clear reasons for it. Um, because the Great Patriotic War, it was the time of tremendous suffering uh, of the Soviet people that still reverberates in Russia and other post-Soviet countries today. According to the latest estimates, uh, the Soviet Union lost more than 27 million people, uh, both combatants and uh, civilians. Um, however, the final count of lives lost is still unknown, actually, and there are organizations in Russia that still search for places of burial of soldiers who have not yet been counted. So we are still counting um, the, the casualties of the war, which is kind of crazy, you know, like it's 75 years uh, ago it, it ended. Uh, so there are also so-called brothers cemeteries or brotherly cemeteries, Bratsky Kladbysha. In many cities, in, especially in Western Russia, and on this slide you see a brother's cemetery in Veliki Luki, which is my hometown. It is uh, a um, city in the West. It is a small, um, relatively small city, 90,000 um, people. Um, so, and on the tombstone, you cannot really see tombstones, um, the, the, uh, what's written on them very well here, uh, but on those tombstones you would see names but you would also see unknown soldier, unknown soldier, unknown soldier, unknown soldier, so many of those names. Um, so this is really a huge boon uh, because many people in Russia do not even know where their dead perished and where they were buried. Um, so uh, now I want to uh, show you a little video. Actually, I'm gonna stop sharing this uh, and I'm going to share my um, video because I think there is, um, you know, when we say 27 million, you know, it's, it's a big number. American uh, losses were um, only, I don't want to say only, uh, 400,000, uh, but uh, I just want to show it very, very visibly. Sure. So um, here, is, here is a video. It's called uh, The Fallen of World War II. Um, and uh, Shanna, please let me know if, if anything is not uh, working right. Um, this, I'm gonna show you just a little chunk. Um, and uh, right now he just finished talking about the um, American losses, uh, 400,000 people. Um, and uh, each of those little figurines um, represents a thousand people. Uh, so let's watch. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France. Over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fighting. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. The initial invasion brought relatively few casualties on both sides, but the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. Nazi invasions were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded, but took the fight to the Nazis. 
Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the U.S., which includes the British colonies. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the U.S. and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, which took place in France and Belgium. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front, Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of the European war, was Stalingrad. The German Sixth Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. When you include these POWs, roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. But winning the war came at a cost. Eight point seven million is the official tally by the Russian military, a hotly disputed number. Some studies have calculated as many as fourteen million dead. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts, including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military debts on the timeline, it looks like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. So I'm going to um, stop sharing and uh, go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so I think this was um, very visual, right? Like the end, and, and uh, um, Notice that uh, this visual, that's really striking visual, really talked only about um, close to 9 um, million people, uh, the army people who died. Uh, and so imagine now that the total losses are three times more. Um, so that's, that's absolutely staggering. Um, right, so uh, the war history and legacy in Russia is very personal. Uh, in many families, someone died or was injured in the war or experienced relocation, evacuation, or starvation. And virtually every family has some stories, its own heroes, wartime photographs, and likely some medals. Um, and I just want to share just a tiny bit of personal, um, uh, personal uh, history. So my hometown is Veliki Luki, as you can see on the, on the screen. It is in the northwest of Russia. It is a really ancient city. It was the first mention in the Chronicles is 1166, just 21 years earlier than uh, Moscow. However, you will not find a single ancient monument in my hometown. Almost all historical landmarks, uh, landmarks in my hometown and its vicinity is commemorated the war. Basically, when Germans entered, um, they destroyed a lot, of, uh, a lot of things, and when they were leaving, they, there were also uh, terrible fights. Um, so, Veliki Luge actually is very often called the Little Stalingrad uh, due to the severity of fighting uh, that uh, went on um, there. Uh, and I just want to show you a picture of um, Veliki Luge in 1943. It's actually one of the main uh, streets. 
Um, so uh, my family members, of course, participated in the war, um, and especially on my father's side. And I just want to quickly show you my uh, grandfather, who's right here. He was 27 when the war started. Um, he was not in the active combat. Uh, he, this, this is a group of um, engine drivers. So they were driving um, trains that went to the front lines uh, and were carrying ammunition and then taking wounded um, back to the front, um, kind of to the um, to the rear. Um, and uh, this was actually a very, uh, very um, scary job because the um, railroads were bombed um, very severely. Um, but, you know, my grandfather managed to somehow, somehow not even be injured. And uh, a cool little fact, one of his assignments uh, was to take General Paulus and his staff from Stalingrad to Moscow after they lost the Battle of Stalingrad. So uh, that's, um, I find it kind of cool. Um, anyway, so uh, moving back to the uh, kind of the overall um, the overall memory of the war, um, how do we celebrate this holiday and how do we mourn? So the Red Square Parade is the most famous celebration, but processions and events happen in every city in Russia. And in my childhood, uh, which was in the 80s and 90s, we had Day of Memory always around Victory Day. And the schools, veterans would come to meet with the school kids and tell their stories. Um, and of course, right now, this is greatly diminished because we barely have any veterans left. Um, and there were various events organized on city squares, still organized. And back then, uh, veterans would come with their medals and we kids would, um, would bring flowers, usually red carnations, and uh, give to them. And of course, there are festive concerts where wartime songs are sung. Uh, Russians know many songs uh, of the war by heart. Um, and finally, in the last few years, a new initiative uh, has appeared and gained traction, the so-called Immortal Regiment. I don't know if anyone uh, heard of this. Every once in a while, Western media do talk about this. Uh, this. This initiative is related to the fact that there are fewer and fewer veterans left. And Immortal Regiments, uh, as you can see, um, are processions of people who march through the main city streets and carry portraits of their family members who fought in the war. Uh, this event takes place in many cities in Russia, in countries of the former Soviet Union, and by now in many other countries in the world. Actually, there are a few cities in the U.S. Uh, that, uh, that take part, um, and uh, usually people from Madison, where I am right now, uh, go to Chicago. Uh, there, are, there is a immortal regiment um, procession in Chicago. Um, it actually started, this initiative started as a grassroots initiative in 2012 by journalists in Tomsk who had a personal ritual of getting together with photographs of their families and remembering the war. And then they just kind of decided, well, we like doing this, maybe other people would like it too. So um, they uh, published it in the newspaper that if uh, you guys want, you can bring portraits and many, many people came. Uh, so then the next year they did it in the other cities, uh, mostly through friends organized this um, and the idea really really gained traction um, so see uh, here you can see Immortal Regiment in St. Petersburg and here Immortal Regiment in Vibiki Luki my hometown uh, which of course is much smaller but 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 still um, so um, it is important to know that this initiative was pretty quickly appropriated by the state uh, as state does uh, so in the biggest cities it is now organized by pro-government organizations uh, and here uh, in the Moscow Immortal Regiment, you can see Putin walking uh, in front of the procession with uh, a picture of his father who fought uh, at, the, uh, in, uh, at the Leningrad front. Um, so uh, nowadays, some people refuse to take part in the Immortal, immortal Regiment because they do not, not because they do not honor their dead, but because they feel that this way they legitimize Putin's regime by participating. So what they do instead they prefer to do the Facebook event. Uh, around Victory Day, many people put pictures of their relatives who participated in the war and write uh, their family stories to share. So you can see here that memory of the war is still very much alive in Russia, both due to personal initiatives and to state support and propaganda. Uh, and I think now I will take uh, some questions. Um, I really also, I really, really want to uh, play uh, a song for you, uh, Victory Day, but uh, we can do that later. I really don't wanna, um, I, I do wanna get to the siege uh, of Leningrad. 
Great. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat already. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, will you be discussing the role of the Soviet Union between 1939 and 1941? Uh, no, I won't. Um, okay. And this is, this, is a, this is a very, um, I mean, this was, this was something that I was, you know, really debating uh, because, uh, and this is actually important uh, because in Russia, uh, as I said, this time is studied. Uh, but of course, this time is highly controversial, right? Because uh, we don't just we didn't just have a non-aggression pact with Hitler, which you know would be okay. But we also had the secret protocol uh, where basically the lands were divided between uh, Germany and the Soviet Union. Uh, and when uh, in 1939, of course. Um, the Soviet Union also invaded Poland and, you know, like took the countries of the Baltics. Uh, so it is, uh, there are some really controversial events that happened there. And I just really want to say that um, this is used again, kind of in a propaganda way, basically um, to just kind of set it aside. You know, like to kind of say, well, you know, but everyone, everyone collaborated with the Nazis, everyone, you know, like Western countries, which is true, uh, also um, made pacts uh, with Hitler. So, you know, we are not to blame. Um, you know, like one can probably say that, but at the same time, this is kind of highly controversial and it is not by chance that uh, Soviet Union basically was denying that this secret protocol existed up until you know late 80s early 90s i think it was in late 80s when we finally um finally opened up and said yes it was not just non-aggression pact it was also a secret protocol about dividing uh, europe um and the next question that we have is did the soviet union have any battles with japan uh with what with japan um Yes, uh, but not, um, it, it, somehow again, this is something that's kind of pushed aside um, when we think about the, um, the Soviet Union and the war, uh, because we entered the war with Japan only, I believe, on the 8th of August, uh, 1945. Um, so there were some battles, uh, but, you know, the war was basically... Uh, Kind of finishing finishing up and actually i think that um uh, in china um uh, some people are pretty pissed at us for that <laughs> that, were, that we, were, we were not helping uh okay the next question the world war ii generation is dying out both soldiers and civilians do mm -hmm. you think that russia's current young generation 20 somethings will continue to make such grand celebrations of World War II, or are they less enthusiastic and thinking that it's time to move on? Um, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, I think I, I do not have um, kind of direct connection with that younger generation, but I do think, actually, uh, just looking at some students of mine, um, I just recently, I have a student who is kind of very much pro, you know, immortal regiment and like every year we go with my family. He's like 20, 20 something, 21, I believe, or 22. Um, so, and you see in those, um, I'm not sure you can see it in this picture, but in other pictures of immortal regiment, you can really see that their families come together with, you know, like younger members. I do not know if this is forced. Uh, or this is actually, you know, kind of a genuine uh, feeling. But I, I can say that, you know, like kind of based on what, uh, you know, kind of my friends uh, are doing, and we are you know, like an older generation, of course, um, people who do this kind of Facebook event are mostly kind of my generation, like, th like late, late 30s, early 40s. Um, and uh, they do all of them say we do talk to our kids about this this is really important you know because it's family history it's uh it's really important to talk about it so it's not i don't think it's necessarily um that those kind of big grand celebrations will continue uh, but uh, i think the memory still lives just because it is family history and it is it is very important Okay, so we have two more comments that I'm going to read, and then I think we should go on with the presentation. Okay. So the first comment is, I live in England, where the popular view is that Britain won the war with help from the U.S. 
when uh, you see how the USSR struggled and how many people lost on its own territory, it's sad that the full history is not taught better. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. the first comment. And then the second comment is um, Yuzkov fought at Kalkin Goy in 1939 against the Japanese. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, that's true as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we should move on to the rest of the presentation. Uh, all right, so the next uh, part of my presentation talks about the siege of Leningrad. And um, I really debated on kind of like which turn to take in this presentation, but I decided to talk about the siege just because it's such an important event. Uh, really, when we think about the price that Russia and the USSR paid for this war, the siege of Leningrad comes to mind as the most gruesome and traumatic event. Uh, and this is the time uh, when Leningrad was cut off from the rest of the Soviet Union and the government managed to send only limited supplies to the city by the so-called road of life, um, the waterway on Lake Ladoga, which in winter turned into ice. Uh, so you can see here, this, this map is in Russian, I'm sorry, but you can see, you know, the red basically is the, the Russian territory or the Soviet territory, and here is Leningrad, and it's kind of squished between the... Uh, Finnish Bay and the Ladoga Lake. Um, so on this side, it is uh, cut off by the Germans, and on this side, it's cut off by the Finnish uh, army. You know, the Finnish uh, participation in the war is also a very kind of highly uh, debated, interesting question. Um, so, and here uh, we can see uh, this is the, um, the route on water during the summer navigation, uh, and this is the route on the uh, lake, um, on the ice uh, during winter. So that was established um, kind of soon after the uh, siege started, and um, the road was heavily bombed. Um, so not all supplies managed to get to the city and not all people managed to evacuate. So uh, honestly, historians right now say that no, Stalin did not abandon the city. Uh, um, the USSR did not abandon the city. There were many supplies that were sent, but only um, some amount of them were actually making it uh, to the city. And then, of course, there were uh, problems with the, dis the, the uh, distribution. Um, so uh, next slide, I have uh, some numbers. Uh, so the siege of Leningrad um, continues from September 8, 1941 till January 27, 1944. So it was, uh, it lasted 872 days. And very often you will see in titles of books and titles of movies, like 90 days, the truth about the uh, Leningrad uh, siege. Um, so it's just kind of a pretty number, but actually it, it, it was uh, going for 872. Um, and then um, it's important to talk about Hitler's plan. So originally Hitler did not uh, plan to um, blockade Leningrad. It was, the plan was to quickly take it um, over during the summer of 18, 1941. Um, it was a blitzkrieg uh, idea, uh, but the Soviet army stopped him and um, he realized that uh, more resources would be necessary and he was planning the offensive on Moscow. So, uh, things need, needed to be uh, redistributed. Um, so the plan was changed to blockading Leningrad from the rest of the world and let people die from hunger. And hunger is specifically mentioned in the Nazi documents regarding Leningrad. Uh, this didn't just happen. So we are really dealing here with a case of genocide and uh, um, contemporary historians do call this uh, genocide um, pretty um, every, every once in a while, uh, some historians, you can, you can see that. Uh, interestingly, the uh, date of the uh, lifting of the siege, January 27th, is also the day uh, of um, liberating Auschwitz uh, concentration camp in 1945, uh, also by the Soviet, uh, by the Soviet troops. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting that that date and that event people remember and commemorate, uh, but the event of the siege of Leningrad um, is not um, that well known um, and um, kind of not, um, not talked about uh, very often. Um, so in terms of casualties, we will never know the exact number of uh, people who died in Leningrad. However, available data points out to about 1.5 million, so, uh, million Soviet army and civilians, and civilian deaths out of this number is over 900,000 people. Uh, this is what historians say now, and the numbers, again, might change. 
Um, so uh, over half a million of those people died of hunger and cold during the harsh first winter of 1941-1942, when the city was least prepared for the siege in terms of food and other resources. So uh, let's first talk about food, and uh, I'm sorry, some things will be maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit graphic, and, and it, it is a very, it, it is a very sad topic. Uh, so uh, rationing system was introduced very early, um, basically kind of very soon after after the war started, 18th of July. And at first, you see rations were actually quite okay; uh, no one was too worried. Uh, but then bread rations were cut five times and by November 20th you can see 250 grams for workers um, a little bit more for workers in hot workshops so the workers who worked in military um, factories uh, but office workers adult dependents and children under 12 uh, is 125 grams it's it's really really little it's uh, what like one fourth of a, of a pound um, so um, uh, yeah, so this uh, really, this lowest ration of 125, those cards, uh, really became one of the symbols of the siege. Uh, it is also important to notice, uh, note that bread was uh, distributed, that bread that was distributed really had little nutritional value because there was sawdust, cellulose, and other additives in that bread. So it wasn't just like a piece of bread. Um, and there were ration cards for other foods, um, but uh, I'm not even going to show them because in the first winter, other foods were provided very irregularly. So sometimes people would be able to get some food, sometimes not. Um, and um, basically everyone talks about how it was mostly bread. Um, and um, as you can see from this table, there is an improvement in the rations uh, in December. Uh, basically, this means that there are fewer mouths to feed. Um, many people died from starvations, uh, starvation and also um, a number of people were evacuated through the road of life. Um, so the bread norms um, kind of became, became higher. At the same time, in January and February of 1942, there was so little electric power in the city that bakeries sometimes could not bake bread. So the bread norm was given to people as just flour and people would basically just just eat it as flour uh, or, or try to make some kind of soup if they had the energy and they didn't always have the energy. Um, you can see uh, on this um, a man who just received his bread. This is spring 1942 and you can see that he's, he's uh, truly emaciated. Uh, so what else did people eat? Uh, because a million people still managed to survive in this city. Uh, so there were a few different ways to kind of uh, get by. Uh, if they worked in a factory or in some other organization, they could go to a canteen once a day and receive some meager soup. So those were really, really helping, uh, but not everyone had access. Uh, if their male relatives were close to the front lines uh, around Leningrad, sometimes they, those relatives could visit and bring some food from their own rations. Uh, actually, Putin um, said that his mother survived uh, Leningrad blockade this way, you know, like uh, some relatives came from the front lines and, and brought some food. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the military's rations were not luxurious, but they were definitely bigger than the civilian's rations because, you know, they were useful, right? They were uh, useful. Uh, were, it was important that they fight. Uh, also, black markets operated in the city, and why one could buy food at for exorbitant prices uh, or in exchange for valuables. So, of course, here we see that you know the um, the more well-to-do you are, the better chances of survival uh, you probably have. Um, and um, in the summer of 1942, so that already comes later, after that crazy winter, uh, there was a massive effort to have gardens all over Leningrad. And there was a massive campaign to plant vegetables everywhere on every possible patch of land. So uh, here you can see this is actually Isaaki Cathedral. Right now there's like concrete here everywhere. Uh, but um, there were basically in all parks and all possible patch of land, they were, uh, they were growing vegetables. And uh, that really helped during the second, uh, the second winter. Um, so uh, otherwise, people ate all sorts of things that had some edible particles, and you know, like nowadays, this this will probably really um, um, kind of um, amaze us, right? For example, they ate wood and wallpaper glue, belts made of pigskin, uh, rotten black cabbage leaves, 
house plants, candles, uh, horse meat and horse hooves, if they could get a hold of them, like on this picture, we can see a women found some horse uh, remains and are trying to get some, get some pieces. Uh, cats and dogs are virtually um, disappeared from the city. They were all eaten uh, and uh, Leningraders talk about, you know, like how they had to like kill uh, a cat. Uh, and eat this like really un un uncomfortable kind of traumatic uh, memory when people talk about it. Um, in the memoirs, wood glue is mentioned especially often. Uh, this is uh, wood glue uh, because it's made of animal products and has gelatin, so it could be made edible. Um, and uh, here I see, uh, I, I have an um, excerpt from a diary. Uh, we are eating wood glue. Never mind. You may experience a first spasm of nausea, but I think the revulsion comes from an, the overactive imagination. Uh, the aspect is really not so disgusting if you add cinnamon or a few bay leaves. So uh, this is what people were, um, were eating. Um, and um, uh, there were also some cases of cannibalism. Uh, and this is something that actually was complete taboo to talk about during Soviet times. Um, and even nowadays, it's kind of hard to point that out. Um, people are generally very uncomfortable uh, talking about this, and people, especially people who kind of buy this, uh, the Soviet, this Soviet contemporary Russian propaganda of, you know, like heroic Russians, they say, no, there was no crime in St. Petersburg, there was no cannibalism, it's, it's unthinkable, you know, like our people were kind of standing to the kind of last drop of blood. And of course, it is not true because people were really taken to, uh, to extremes. <clears throat> and who are we to, to blame them really, like, and to, um, to pass any judgment? Um, and here, uh, I changed the slide but didn't talk about it. Uh, here you can see that children's talks and games all revolved around food and uh, also around dying. Um, not only hunger was the cause of suffering and death, but also cold. Uh, there were severe shortages of electric power. So during the first winter, only military plants, hospitals, bakeries, and canteens had power, and even that for just a limited time of the day. Uh, heating was not working in people's apartments. Uh, and the winter was really, really harsh. So minus 30, minus 35 Celsius, which is minus 22, minus 31 Fahrenheit. Um, so people had to pile up on them lots of clothes, all, all, often old rags, in desperate attempts to keep warm. Uh, and you could see people in the summer of 20, uh, 1942 um, walking around the city in warm coats and in felt boots just because they couldn't just get that chill out of them for, for many months uh, afterwards. Uh, people did manage to get water even though there was the, the water pumps were not working. Um, they, they did that in the canals, if they lived not very far, from some underground pipes, or gathered snow and melted it. Uh, and then they used those little pot belly stoves to um, warm up the water and maybe cook, and uh, to some extent to warm up the apartments, but um, it was really hard to find how to um, actually fire up those, those stoves. So all the furniture, hardwood floor, wooden uh, structures in the city uh, were disassembled and people used them. Um, so here, here I have a couple of pictures of people getting water from some um, underground um, pipe, I think. Maybe. I don't think it, this, is, this is canal. Uh, and another one, this is actually right on Nevsky Prospect, like right in, the, in downtown, uh, people are getting some water. Um, so, not surprisingly, people were dying everywhere, at home, at work, on the street, uh, and um, some kind of part of harsh reality, very often people would choose not to report if their um, family member died, uh, because then they could keep their ration cards for some time, usually for about a month, depending on when, when they died and when they got those, those ration cards. Uh, so, if you if you do that, you, you basically have to hide, kind of keep uh, the dead body in your apartment uh, and basically live with the corpse of your family member, which um, just uh, kind of shuddering when you, when you imagine that. Um, and uh, many dead bodies were not buried, uh, so the conditions in the city were totally anti-sanitary. And in the 1942, in the spring, there was a big campaign to clean the city of corpses to prevent uh, epidemics. The authorities were really afraid uh, that an epidemic of typhus might, might start. It didn't start. Um, 
so uh, one of the terrible symbols of the siege were children's sleds. Uh, they were used to bring water from the canals, but also to transport dead bodies. So you can see uh, here both of these uh, sleds of dead bodies. Um, and um, I have an um, excerpt from memoirs by Sofia Sabovska, a school teacher. I'm going to read it. It is scary to remember the winter of 1941, meaning 1942, right, that, that winter. Terrible frost. The temperature is close to minus 40. Under one's feet, there is either ice from the spilled water, which we had to carry in buckets, or huge heaps of snow. There was no one to remove them. The icy trams stand like enchanted monsters in fairy tale slumber. The broken wires hang like long white threads. In the mornings, there are processions of sleds with dead bodies in white shrouds. You walk and walk, and it seems like there wouldn't be any end to this, uh, to this road. So um, um, the last thing I want to say is that uh, when you go to St. Petersburg, when people go to St. Petersburg, they usually visit uh, palaces, churches, big beautiful museums like the Hermitage. But it is really important to remember that this really beautiful city went through hell during the 1940s. And this tremendous suffering and the memory of the siege still is etched into the city itself. Um, and so in the end of my presentation, I want to show you a few landmarks in St. Petersburg that are related to the war and, and a few, suggest a few museums for the time uh, you actually go and visit. Uh, so this is uh, one of the signs uh, that was used during the war, uh, says here in this blue, it says citizens um, during artillery fire, this side of the street is the most dangerous. And there were a number of, um, of signs like this throughout the city and some of them um, were kept after the war as a reminder um, of, of, the, of the siege. Uh, the next one, uh, this is a mark from one of the shells fired on Leningrad by the Nazis. So they didn't kind of clean it up, but they actually kept it um, as a reminder. Um, and uh, on this embankment, this is an embankment of a canal, uh, we see um, this um, Kind of monument sculpture. Uh, so here inhabitants of the blockaded Leningrad took water from an ice hole. And, and you can see uh, flowers, right? There, these are fresh, fresh flowers. I don't know if this was done for the, for the Victory Day or uh, generally those flowers are um, kind of constantly, constantly there. People bring them. Um, another one uh, is uh, here. So this says, in this house, Tanya Savicheva wrote her siege diary. And then uh, below, a quote from the diary, which is the last entry, only Tanya is left. Uh, so Tanya Savicheva is one of the symbols of the, of the siege. Uh, she was a girl who was 11 in the beginning of the war. And her diary is actually very short. Like this is the entire diary. Uh, and on each page, there is just a note about what family member died and when, and uh, sometimes at what time. And so the last pages are Savichev uh, died, uh, all of them died, only Tanya, um, only Tanya was left. Um, actually, Tanya herself was eventually uh, evacuated through the road of life, uh, but did die um, from disease soon after. Um, soon after the evacuation. And there are a number of monuments to Tanya uh, in St. Petersburg and also in um, Nizhny Novgorod where, where she, was, she was evacuated to. Um, and um, also a few uh, museums, uh, actually Piskaryovsky Cemetery, um, very important land landmark. Uh, this is the place where many people who perished in the, uh, in the siege uh, were buried. Um, uh, then the Museum of Defense and Siege, um, kind of a uh, downtown, a very important place to visit. Um, uh, has a lot of um, lot of objects uh, from the siege, um, so very graphically shows. Like you can really imagine how things things were. Um, and then a couple memorials uh, at the place where the road of life um, was uh, started. Uh, so the broken ring memorial shows um, symbolizes that the blockade basically that this road of life managed to kind of penetrate uh, the blockade and uh, break the ring. Uh, and then the museum road of life also in that, uh, in the vicinity of that, uh, it's uh, done in the shape of a shard of ice 
uh, that again symbolizes that road of life in uh, winter months when it was bombed, um, but people still managed to either evacuate from the city or um, uh, bring supplies. Uh, so I strongly recommend uh, when you are in St. Petersburg to pay attention to those landmarks that are just scattered around the city. You can just kind of see them uh, and also to visit those special places of memory um, and those museums. Um, so in my last slide really is some selected bibliography. This is only in English, of course, I'm using some Russian sources too. Um, uh, really um, good books, maybe one of the first books about uh, the siege, um, Harrison Sal Salisbury, uh, a, an American uh, journalist who managed to uh, interview uh, a number of people soon after the siege, uh, soon after the war. Uh, then Adamovich and Granian's A Book of the Blockade was really the first book published in the Soviet Union that kind of try, attempted to tell the truth of the siege and not just kind of picture it in the heroic terms um, and um, really show the suffering of the people. And then uh, two contemporary um, historical, um, historical accounts. Um, very striking, uh, very interesting books. So if you have, um, if you have any additional questions uh, about the books, you can uh, also email me uh, and you, of course, you can ask questions now uh, about this part of the presentation.